Hi, everybody. It's Michelangelo Caruso. Welcome to another episode of the Talk To Me podcast. I'm on with Jason Stanford today. Hi, Jason. Hi. Thanks for having me. Jason's a very interesting cat. He's got an interesting career. He's also put out an interesting book with a couple of co-authors. Before we talk about that, I want to remind you, if you're watching the video version of this podcast, you can catch the audio version on Podbean, Talk To Me podcast. If you're listening to the audio version, make sure you check out the video versions on the Michelangelo Caruso YouTube channel. I wanted Jason on the uh, on the podcast because of this new book. It is fantastic. Jason, forget the Alamo. It's by uh, uh, three authors, actually. You co-authored with Brian Burrow, Chris Tomlinson. Which of the two do you like best? Brian's my best friend. Uh, oh. Chris is a hell of a guy, <laughs> but Brian and I are best friends. That was supposed to be a prank question. I know. It, man. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right, good to know. Um, and when I when I got it, I thought, well, I'm going to be I'm going to be learning all about the Alamo itself. And actually, very, very little of this very thick book is donated or dedicated to the battle itself, because as you guys point out, there is just so much more involved with this, both both pre event and post event. Um, I appreciate you being on with me today. How has the book been received? Because I imagine you're you're losing some friends in Texas. You're losing some uh uh, people who had a certain image of Davy Crockett and William Travis and Jim Bowie, you've, you've, you've kind of turned this thing on its head, not the first guys to do it, but maybe no. the best. Well, uh, I like to think of all the books ever written about the Alamo. This one's the funniest, uh, but that's the lowest of bars when it comes to Texas state history. Uh, I like to think of uh, when you refer to the friends that uh, I might've lost, I like to think of my father-in-law. He was raised in rural Arkansas very traditional guy, conservative leaning. And, uh, you know, he and I have had political differences through the years. He read the book, you know, and he, he like most guys his age, he grew up on the Fess Parker, Davy Crockett stuff, which was incredibly impactful for American men. It was really that cemented the vision of stoic manhood for them. Yes. And so to suggest that the Alamo didn't go down exactly as Disney portrayed it, is considered heresy by a lot of people in Texas and in this country. But my father-in-law read the book and all the way through, he kept emailing me saying, I can't believe it really happened like this. And I I'd like to think it's because we wrote the book so well, but I know it's because as a country right now, we're all really willing to examine our foundation and question our foundation. The, the, we all know what the downside of trust in public institutions is. Well, the, the upside is, we don't just believe whatever's coming our way. Uh, people of all political persuasions are willing to take a fresh look at their history. And I'm glad that uh, we've had such a great response to this book. I'm glad too, because this is an interesting time for fact checking and getting things straight mm -hmm. uh, and ideology. It's, it's just stunning to me how people attach themselves to fact and uh, or fiction and nonfiction when it comes to uh, what they stand up for, what they believe in. Uh, and the Alamo is such an interesting example of, of, of this. Uh, you mentioned that the book was funny. It is funny. And I, as I was reading it, and by the way, I was tipped off to it by a New York Times review, and you probably know where I'm going with this. The New York Times did not like a couple bits of the writing style. They mentioned uh, that it was a little bit maybe too uh, casual. The book yes. certainly has rigor. For you young people watching, rigor means end notes. <laughs> There's research in this book, man. It's really yep. hardcore. Uh, but there's a casual writing style. The NYT uh, like to throw this phrase in your face. Um, there's no other way to quote, there's no other way to put it. Santa Ana was pissed, end quote. History books don't read like that normally. Which one of you guys brought that kind of style to this book? That, that was mostly me and Brian on that one. Um, uh, Brian's an accomplished writer. Writing, uh, Co-writing a book with, with Brian Burrow is like getting called up to the 1927 Yankees. Uh, his, his book, Barbarians at the Gate, revolutionized the way nonfiction business books are written. And Public Enemy, uh, a, a James Garner, I think it was a Showtime movie, was made off Barbarians at the Gate. Yes. Uh, Public yes. Enemy, of course, made into that awful Johnny Depp movie. Big Rich is considered sort of a secular Bible in Texas. And then Days of Rage is, is selling a ton now. So he, he knows how to write a book really well, but I think anyone who's read his canon will notice that this is the first one that's funny. 
Um, but he's a funny guy. So I'm glad that maybe us all writing the book together unleashed a bit of his funny in the footnotes. And maybe yeah. it'll, it'll read better for the young people who who maybe struggle. I don't know. Standards are changing a bit. I think society, everything's becoming more casual. Yes. How interesting yeah. that the truth and, and fact is becoming more casual, even as we become the best educated society in history. Mm-hmm. And that comes up in the book a lot, too. Uh, I may have interrupted you a second ago. No, I, I think sometimes people mistake a high-minded, serious tone for serious information. I think there's a way of getting it. I think the way to really get past the natural defenses someone has to new information is to get them entertained and get them emotionally involved in a story. And if you can do that, then people are willing to enjoy a book and learn new information. But if you make them sit down and sit still and by God, I'm gonna teach you things that you should know because you're wrong, well, you're gonna put up your defenses. So we made a we made a conscious decision to write it in an entertaining conversational way. And it's a nice parallel track to how a lot of people have learned about the Alamo through entertainment, oh, yeah. right? So here's history. Here's something That's that a good actually point. happened. That's a really good point. I never thought about that. You could put that in the revised revised. I can't wait to think that up later. That's great. <laughs> so this idea that we that you mentioned the the previous generation a couple of generations ago now learning about Davy Crockett through Fess Parker and the Coonskin Cap. Yep. Uh, a most recent generation learning about it through uh, Billy Bob Thornton's version of Davy Crockett. And I think the movie was called Remember the Alamo or something clever like that. Yeah. Uh, but it's fascinating to me. Um, and, and you called this book, you actually termed it, like you gave it its own genre, which is great. Hist- historiography. Is that, right. is that how you say it? Yeah, it's a history of the history of the Alamo. Uh, we yeah. weren't uh, because so much of what has happened with this story, this creation myth of Texas, the story that we tell ourselves here in Texas to, to show why we're different and why we're braver and more independent than people from, I don't know, Vermont, um, is it, the story has evolved and the way we have told the story has changed over the years. And we keep, every generation fights about this history. And I think that that history of the history is much more interesting than what happened over 13 days. 100%. We're going to, and I want to spend most of our time today on that. We are going to talk, for those of you on the edge of your seats, eating popcorn, we are going to talk about the battle itself and yep. some of the things that happened and you think happened that didn't happen at all. Uh, I don't want to do, do we do spoiler, uh, spoiler alerts with books? I know we do them with movies. Um. Yeah, we probably should tell people spoiler alerts. Yeah, if if you are not current on the the what has been widely known in among historians since 1990 about an event that took place in 1836, spoiler alert. Stop this podcast. Go buy the book and read it. We'll wait yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I'm always interested about spoiler alerts with regard to history because I yeah, mean, if you if you study this stuff, you should know it already. Like everybody knows the Titanic sank, right? We don't need to give you the spoiler alert about that when the movie starts. Yep. But yeah, there are it's, some things it's like in here being that are, unwilling to uh, writing a review of Lincoln and, and trying not to talk about what happens at the end. Yeah, spoiler alert. That's too funny. <laughs> so let's talk about um, let's talk about the real foothold for most of this drama, which is the ideology and the hero worship that seems to be like a companion guide to the whole Alamo adventure. Uh, for those people that don't know what the Alamo was, give us the thumbnail sketch. How do you explain it to, to, to a, an 18 year old that doesn't know what the Alamo is? Well, in the middle of this te- of what is now San Antonio once uh, stood uh, in the middle of nowhere. Um, it was a Spanish mission, which is basically a, a sort of a churchy fort. Um, we are the outer reaches of the Spanish empire. And over the years, it became a secular fort. And then, uh, then it became the, uh, a military outpost for Mexico. Te, uh, the white settlers in Texas and the Tejanos got in a squabble with Mexico, and there was a, a there was a revolution. Uh, the Tex the white settlers te- teamed up with some of the Tejanos, and they took it over, and they occupied the Alamo as a fort when the Army of Mexico came back in to take Texas back. Uh, the legend is that these white settlers from Tennessee, including Davy Crockett in Mississippi that they knowingly, they knew that they were going to die. They faced overwhelming odds, but they held out as long as they could 
to buy Sam Houston time to raise an army to defeat Santa Ana and win Texas for, for the cause of freedom and against tyranny. Pretty sick. I think I get it. Yes. Uh, almost none of that is true. A 13 day siege. Right. About uh, a little shy of 200 people died at the Alamo. There's a, yeah, it, let's say about 200. No one's really quite sure. Defending and the Alamo. Defending the Alamo. And a bunch Alamo. of people that we don't talk about died outside the Alamo. Multiples Nearly. of those people died, and sadly, mostly due to friendly fire, uh, because they're very badly trained and armed troops, uh, but there were just so many of them that eventually they, they got over the walls. Shy of 2,000, correct? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so... That's another thing I think that that lent some uh, some cachet to this, you know, the un, unbeatable odds and, and this exactly. kind of thing. But um, uh, the I've, as I read the book, uh, forget the Alamo. I'm thinking about which, by the way, for those of you who don't know, is the is the antithesis of the battle cry that Sam Houston uh, wrote uh, uh, made famous uh, when he revenged or how would you say it avenged avenged thank you um and, and eventually won the independence for uh, texas correct right yeah i mean what so they weren't supposed to even occupy the, the alamo sam houston ordered jim Bowie to go there and raise the fort so that it we wouldn't be fighting over it you don't defend a fort that way it's not like in lord of the rings when you defend a castle uh, it, and it was far too big to defend with 200 men. But William Travis was a romantic fool. He's this 25 year old who's finally given command. And he thought he could convince through correspondence, uh, Sam Houston to send the Texas army to go defend it. It would, it, that would have been suicide for everyone. Uh, they tried to give up and tried to surrender on the first day of the siege, but Santa Ana said, no, I'm going to kill you uh, because technically they were pirates. This wasn't a war, this was piracy. They were trying to take land away from Mexico and secede. Uh, and then the day before the siege, uh, before the before the end of the siege, they tried to surrender again. These these were they were not willingly giving their lives up. They they just wanted to give up. Yeah. So when everything went to hell and all of the white soldiers were killed, um, this was a disaster. It I mean. It caused panic among all the Texians, which is what the white settlers called themselves. And, and Sam Houston had to come up with a story about how this horrible military blunder shouldn't panic them. And so he started creating the revenge myth that exists to this day. Uh, they all knew that if they fought, that they had to fight and beat Santa Ana or they were going to be killed and burned, just like their friends at the Alamo. And so remember the Alamo began as a revenge myth where they had to kill the Mexicans or they would be killed. Yeah. This reminds me a lot of the uh, Custer's Last Stand, minus mm -hmm. the revenge. There was no real other shoe to drop uh, eventually with the with the Native Americans and so on. But Custer, terribly outmanned, uh, warned that this was going to be a problem. People uh, actually refused to come to Custer's help. I think this was the situation at the Alamo as well. There were there were yep. people that watching this thing and saying, no, no, we're not going to go in. It would just be worse. Um, but as I'm reading the book, I'm thinking to myself, Jason, about, you know, the kinds of things that we expect from our heroes. We, we, the word whole, you're a writer, you probably know this, the word whole, it, it, when it originally was conceived, was about perfection, flawlessness, right, to be whole. And, and when we think about our heroes today, we want them to be flawless, we want them to be whole, we want them to be uh, without uh, sin. Yes. And yet these, the, the triumvirate, as they're kind of referred to in the book, they're like the most sinful guys ever. Bowie was a slave trader and a shyster. Travis was a, uh, took advantage of women apparently. And, and two of the three were failed politicians. Right. Yeah. And, and I don't think it's an accident that we picked three to, to worship. There are more interesting people there. there uh, there's Juan Seguin, who really was the hero of the Alamo and the whole Texas Revolution. But it's no accident that we worship the, a trinity. Um, and this is, after all, a bit of a Christ-like metaphor, uh, a myth. Um, ah, interesting. These, these men knowingly gave their lives over to help so that others may live. Yeah. And now we, we talk about their sacrifice. Yeah, and this is a Christ-like myth. Yeah, 
and, and, and which is part, why which is why criticizing them is considered heresy here. I think you're onto something exactly right about how we 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 give them perfect. We assume we confer upon them perfection because we decide yes. they're heroes. And then when we hear that they're not, this is when you know this is when everybody gets upset. Uh, yep. Revisionists are are, are called. Uh, uh, they're the, they become the ones that are creating the fantasy, right? The revisionists, you know, it didn't happen that way, or you're trying to make it something that it wasn't. Yeah. Um, we're we're going to get into that because I do want to reflect on, because I think the Alamo has a lot of parallels in what's happening today in politics and so on. But the other thing that went through my mind as I'm reading the book was not just about how we hold our heroes in such high self-esteem, even if they don't deserve to be, but, but that role reversal and how we hold the enemies in such low self-esteem I was astounded, shame on me, to learn that Mexico had had outlawed slavery way before 1836. Yep. And and these the Texans much you know because uh, and you make a case for it in in the uh, in, in many other people historians do that slavery was really important in the, in the South to the cotton industry. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it's no, it's it's not even remotely controversial to say that that uh, slavery was important to the cotton industry in the United States at the time, and but somehow you can't mention it in Texas, and they say, oh well, other people were, you know, he had other political problems too. I'm like, yeah, but these guys, the cotton farmers, were worried about their slaves. Yeah. Uh, the the reason they were there in the first place is Mexico wanted to hold on to Texas because the Comanches kept raiding San Antonio, and they couldn't convince Mexicans to move up there. And so they invited uh, the, Tex the, the white settlers in to farm cotton, and they brought their slaves in. And Mexico made an accommodation, which is where you always go wrong in slavery. And it, be it created sort of a states rights problem, a lot like what we had with the, with, uh, the United States and the Confederate States. And they kept trying to enforce the, uh, the they kept trying to outlaw slavery uh, in Mexico City, and they kept fighting for loopholes up in Texas. And eventually, uh, there were so many Anglo settlers in Texas that Santa Ana and the Mexican government were legitimately worried about holding on to Texas. They correctly assumed that the United States wanted to take Texas, and so they cut off immigration. So the first illegal immigrants in, Mex in Texas were Americans. Uh, Davy Crockett crossed illegally into Texas. This is uh, you know, that they were trying, there were a lot of factors that led to the Texas revolt, but the big economic push that led them into conflict was slavery. Yeah. Yeah. Although, although Crockett didn't actually go into Texas because of slavery directly, it was just no. part of this malaise, this culture that, that oh, the yeah. time that he lived in, right? Right. Yeah, he was going for political redemption. But the reason there might be political redemption there is because they were building a slave economy, which was thriving. Um, yeah, I, I, I hear that canard a lot from people saying, oh, well, most of the people who died at the Alamo, they didn't own slaves. You know, that these weren't the planter class. Well, yeah, but the planter class were the base of the economy there in Texas. So yeah. if you wanted to be a saloon keeper, you were probably, you know, your customers were probably had some connection to the cotton economy. Also, if you needed a guy to mow your lawn back in 1835, you, you hired someone else's slave. That's yeah. everyone benefited from the slave economy during a slave economy. It's not like if you didn't own a slave, you weren't connected to it somehow. Let's stay with General Santa Ana for just a minute, because uh, in the book, I, I'm, I'm having trouble if, if deciding if you guys thought that he was fair, brutal or both. Can you set me straight on that? I think he was a pragmatic politician who was unbelievably brutal. Um, yeah, he pushed his men far past what a, uh, a compassionate general would do, drove them in an extraordinarily cold and late winter, uh, and stretched his army out in a way that it, it, he showed no concern for his own men, much less uh, his enemy. And uh, I don't know how you look at what he did to the, uh, they were pirates, sure, but making sure that they, you know, a lot of his generals asked for mercy for the captives and he had them executed and then burning their bodies instead of burying them. I mean, that's, it's really hard to look back on that. However, yeah. legally justified he was to do that and not feel some revulsion. Now, to say uh, he was, he was, he wasn't a tyrant though. He, I mean, 
there were differences in government, but he was operating legally under the, the he was not only was he operating legally under their rules at the time, but the white settlers in Texas enjoyed more freedom than any other Mexican citizen. They didn't have tariffs imposed upon them. They had amnesty from, from taxes for a long time, and they were the only ones allowed to own slaves. Um, they had more freedom than any other Mexican citizen. Interesting. I, I read that he sent his officers to charge the fort first. I thought that was an interesting decision. Two interesting decisions. The first was sending his officers in to storm. They were, they were like, I think the phrase was shooting fish in a barrel, uh, killing these Mexicans as they were trying yeah. to come over the wall. Uh, and then the second interesting decision was these people are in a fort with limited supplies. Mm -hmm. Now he did wait, he did wait 13 days and he tested yep. them during those 13 days. Why didn't he just wait them out? He, he killed hundreds and hundreds of his own men by, by, by doing it on day 13. Yeah. The, and his army had not yet caught up. He was still waiting for the big guns in his arsenal to get to San Antonio. There is not a tactical or strategic reason to do what he did. He was just pissed, like we write in the book. He yeah. hated the fact that these people were showing him up, and he wanted to get revenge. Maybe and a bit of would, ego then. Yeah. Oh, yeah. A lot of ego. Yeah. Okay. So well, let's get into the battle, um, which is where which is where a lot of people have their their mooring ropes and. Uh, Again, spoiler alert, we're going to cut some of your mooring ropes, everybody. Um, when I was a kid, one of the things that really got me about this was that Jim Bowie was not a well man. He was, uh, do we know how near death he was? Was he ever going to recover? No, I mean, they, I, don't, I don't think they had penicillin back then. Um, yeah, whatever he had, they didn't have medicine for at the time. And uh, it's entirely possible he died before the battle started. Interesting. Which, which is not to his shame. I mean, he was dying. So yeah, yeah. Well, again, uh, this kind of stuff is not convenient to your health. You know, they don't attack yeah. when you're feeling the best. You know, bright and chipper in the morning. Yeah. And in fact, I think they attacked early in the morning, trying to get the element of surprise or whatever. Yep. So Bowie's in bed, sick. Travis is a uh, young and impetuous. Uh, Crockett is probably the least. Is it fair to say he was the least combat ready of the of the triumvirate? No, he'd actually seen combat in the uh, in the Indian Wars. Um, okay, uh, and some pretty horrible stuff he'd seen that had left a huge impression on him. He 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 was among the oldest and among the most uh, veteran. Uh, Travis, I, I don't know, had ever seen combat before, uh, which might have been why he was so eager to get into it. Uh, the yeah, no, Crockett both comes across as a fool and as a, a sort of a sad, wise figure. I'm not really sure what to make of him. Didn't know him personally. Crockett was 49? Yeah, I believe so. Travis, 26. And I think Bowie was in between, uh, but on the older side. Yeah, but he didn't look a day over 55. Yeah, rough life, this guy. Yeah. Um, all right. So one of the most famous uh, things in the battle was happened before the battle when Travis decides he's got to know who's with him and who's not. And I think it probably came from a movie. I've lost track now, uh, but it's been it's been... This is the interesting thing about ideology. It's like in today's society, Jason, it seems like the more we say something, the more it must be true. Yep. And yet that's not how fact works, right? No, but it is how brains work. That's the problem. Yeah. So the situation was that this line in the sand thing never happened. That was a Sam Houston mechanism to- No, what that was- that actually happened, and I think it was it might have been Thermopylae. Like that, it was a sort of a the, a line in the sand was a well known uh, trope at the time, and several several years after the actual uh, battle of the Alamo, there was someone who made up a story about oh, and then then he did this line in the sand, and like this is it was just concocted later. Yeah, yeah. The story of um, the lady that survived. Uh, Dickinson, Susanna Dickinson. Yeah. Fascinating. Totally hit the, fascinating. Hit in the church, apparently hit by a stray bullet. Yep. And then she becomes like a talking piece because she's one of the only survivors. And not surprisingly, perhaps her, her story changes depending on who, who she talks to the rest of her yep. life. Um, not a very good historical benchmark for, for getting it right. No, no. The, um, yeah, her story changed wildly, uh, depending on who was paying her to tell the story. Uh, you got to think, 
you know, she lost uh, her husband in the fight and it was, must have been a horrible experience. And, you know, I, I don't think they, um, they didn't have, they didn't have a lot of trauma care back then. So I'm sure she had a lot of unmet uh, trauma that she was working through in the only way she could. And she was a single mother back in the time when they didn't really have a lot of job prospects. Uh, she ended up uh, working as a prostitute. Um, she sold her story for money. She she made her way as best she could. Um, she did not seem to shy away from attention. But again, attention is how she got paid. So who's to say? I kept thinking about her cowering in the church, listening to the, because these rooms weren't, these, these the, the place was made out of adobe or some sort of clay, right? The walls? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the thickness of the walls must have afforded some sort of a, uh, reassurance, but there was no roof on the church back then. So, uh, yeah. Um, so she's hearing all of the, the, the killing and the torture and the, the, the screaming getting closer, the screaming. It, it must've been the screams probably never left her. Oh, yeah, the, 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 uh, the majority of the, the worst fighting happened just on the other side of an Adobe wall from her. Amazing. Yeah. So tragic, tragic thing. Uh, maybe it did need to happen, but it happens. And now we start telling this, this untruthful version of what happened because it serves, it serves hero worship well. It also serves the state of Texas well. Then the book gets really interesting because people start digging in on the myth for various reasons. Um, but yeah, when Texas was, existed as a republic, as an independent country, uh, emancipation was not just outlawed, it was unconstitutional. You could not be a free black person in Texas when Texas was its own country. So to say, yeah, to yeah. say that Texas was founded for liberty leaves uh, some important details out. Did I read that, and I don't know how to, how to say this, so I, need, I need you to fix it for me. Uh, did I read that, there, that the Texas school systems are legislated to teach the Alamo the pro version, the hero version of the Alamo. Oh yeah, so yeah, the it's 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 kind of a sad story. I mean, th this is the story. This is the story that really motivated me in my work. Um, you never really had to force Texans to teach the Alamo as a as a hero myth. It it never occurred to anyone that it wasn't. And so teachers for years would teach you know kids in seventh grade history, which in Texas is an entire year about uh, the, the heroes at the Alamo. You never had to require that they were uh, heroes. And then, um, so in the evolution of how we teach social studies in history, first they, they, you know, they started making sure that to teach about people of color and women in the 70s, 80s and 90s. And then they started looking at Texas. Okay, what do we do? And at the turn of the century, it was pretty they were doing a good job of it, actually. They're, they're, I found a textbook from when George W. Bush was governor that had an entire page about the role of slavery in the Texas Revolution, and this was for seventh graders. So we did have the courage to tell kids the truth back then. And then there's the conservative backlash, and they started insisting, like, no, no, you have to, you have to teach that these were heroes. And the Hispanics on the State Board of Education said, well, why can't we be heroes too? Most of the people who died at the Alamo were, you know, Tejanos and, Te and Hispanics. And they have these little fights about, well, yours weren't the leaders and, you know, just these ridiculous political fights. And so the first compromise they landed on were you have to teach that every single one of the 187 people at the Alamo who died were heroes. And that's you can't possibly teach 187 people in an entire school year. It became a matter of weird temporal logistics. How do you fit the curriculum in the time allotted to teach it? And they redo this every seven years. So in the course of seven years, every teacher looked at this curriculum and said, what the hell do I do? This is impossible. Because the politicians had given them something they can't do. And so Stephen Cure, one of the quiet heroes of this whole book, former history teacher himself, work behind the scenes like okay well we got to take out words you know the the order they got from the state board of education is just require less stuff they're still going to teach the history but you can't be so specific everyone was like no i want mine on the list i want mine on the list and so you had these long lists that were impossible for seventh graders to to learn 
I couldn't get when my kids were seventh grade, I, I couldn't get them to remember to, to go to flush. So, I mean, getting them to remember this list of 10 names is beyond them. So they get to the, they have this fight again after seven years and they throw up their hands and say, okay, just teach that they were all heroic. And, uh, and so they were, they were, they were working towards this and Cure's working group, Stephen Cure, and he had these experts and they said, just take the word out. You don't need it. It's just an extra word. And that leaked and the governor tweeted that it was politically correct nonsense. And so for a day in 2018, I think it was, or 16, we had this huge political fight where all these politicians took turns talking about how, by God, everyone at the Alamo was heroic and these politically correct idiots are blah, blah, blah. And so then they had this meeting and said, okay, they're all heroic, state law. And we don't have to teach that anyone else is heroic in Texas. We don't have to teach that Neil Armstrong or any, any of the astronauts were heroic. We don't have to teach that Jackie Robinson was heroic. We don't even have to teach that Sam Houston, who actually won the war, was heroic. But we do have to teach that all those poor souls at the Alamo were heroic. Just because no one can teach this, they, it, the Alamo isn't history. It's a, it's, a, it's a secular myth. It's a secular religion down here. How is that enforced? If a teacher should color outside the lines and make some kind of a statement in class. Has it been tested? Well, uh, no, it hasn't because it's completely unenforceable crap. Um, and what we're seeing across the country right now are parents showing up to school board meetings and yelling about critical race theory, which is not taught in any public school, but that's not really what we're talking about. Um, what would happen these days is they compl uh, someone would either secretly record or they'd get a textbook or a lesson plan or homework that comes home and they'd be upset and they'd complain to the principal and these days, in certain districts, that would get a teacher fired. Uh, for example, there was a principal in North Texas who recently got fired because he had a book, a, a sort of one of those anti-racist books that's that's on the bestseller list these days. There was one in his office during a meeting he had with parents. He wasn't teaching it. He wasn't talking about it. He principal just had a, a book in his office about racism, and so he was fired. So these days, you can get fired for almost anything in Texas. When I was a kid, I never thought I would have to learn about font sizes and pixels and kerning and leading, but there it is in, in, in any basic software program. Things yep. are getting more complicated. We're getting more sophisticated as we, as we develop as a society. The truth isn't as simple as it used to be. It's more nuanced. You know, the, a lot of the good guys were kind of bad. A lot of the bad guys were kind of good, yep. but it takes more oxygen to explain all of these things. Yep. But I, sometimes I think our society, like we don't have the patience to weed through it. Uh, no, and it's, we have, there's so much more to weed through. We're exposed, we process so much more information than, than our parents did. Yeah. And so it comes to, it falls to guys our age, Michael, to, to consciously make our brains more plastic and not just to react against something, to, but to, to adapt with it and to take from it what is true and, and to discard what isn't. Um, yeah. And one thing that maybe we need to discard is that there anyone can be good or bad. It's what we do or what our intentions are, but none of us are all good and none of us are all bad. And to say one or the other is to cast a judgment that can be negated by the thing we do in the next moment. So we're seven generations later uh, from 1836, seven generations smarter, I'd like to think, I'm, I'm, I'm reading a book called Forget the Alamo, Everybody, and I'm, and I'm thinking about January 6th of 2021 and the insurrection. And I'm thinking about how difficult, they're, they're investigating it now, how difficult it is to document pandemonium and make sense of it and, and truly find out what happened. Uh, you've said in the book many times, we may never know a lot of important things that happened uh, in that fateful attack, um, we need to get better at talking to each other and understanding motivation and what happened yep. and, and what we can do to avoid this kind of thing in the future. Um, do you see us getting better at that through education, any, any kind of uh, mechanism? I think conversations like this are good. I think um, we wrote the book in a way that we hoped someone who would disagree with us or who had been raised to believe in the myth would still at least wouldn't see themselves as the bad guy in the book. 
It's important to tell our stories in a way that gives someone who might disagree with us a way into the story. Too often these conversations are had right now, we're always seeking final judgment. Yes. Um, uh, whether you call it cancel culture or you're on the other side of the Me Too movement where, where you don't think Louis C.K. should be allowed back into a comedy club uh, without properly apologizing. These are, there are good points on both sides and I don't wanna e equate both sides here. But when we, we talk to and about each other as if a final judgment is possible, and it's just not. Uh, what, I mean, what's going to happen? Like, Michael, you did something bad and, and you agree. And then what? Are you bad forever? Like, yeah. we have to allow people back into the world and and have a, have a way of talking about each other that doesn't seek permanent you know, banishment from society. Yeah. I, it's like the difference between dialectic and debate. In debate, I have to win you over in order to be done. Yeah. And, and dialectic, we can just talk, we can disagree on some things, we can still say we had a good talk, I learned some stuff from you, you learned some stuff from me, we don't have to have a, what do they call it in wrestling, a decision? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, what if what I'm saying is true for if what I'm saying is true, it doesn't really matter if you agree, or you see defeat. I mean, I think too often we have this what a part of the most annoying reaction I have to, we've gotten to the book is, well, why don't you just debate me about the book? Well, I wrote a book, read it, have your own opinion. It's not like we're going to sit down and someone's declare a winner like, oh, my book lost a debate. You know, it's this isn't come debate me or you're scared. It's write your own book. Yeah. Tell me what you think about it. Let's have a conversation. But there, we keep trying to find some final judgment as if we'll be proven right. Yeah. Let's close with uh, one of the most interesting uh, elements of the book is uh, Phil Collins and the, this uh, collection of Alamo artifacts that he has of dubious uh, provenance. Yeah. Um, do you think the, that the museum or this uh, renovation is actually going to happen with the Collins project? Boy, I really got to back up because I think we just lost all your listeners there. So, yeah, the book starts with, uh, and you're a music guy, so that, that probably had to, you enjoy that part. Um, uh, by the way, it, it wasn't lost on me that, that Phil Collins came from a group called Genesis, the yep. origin, right? Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, the book opens with Ozzy Osbourne urinating on the Cenotaph, which is the memorial outside the, the, uh, the Alamo. And it pretty much closes with Phil Collins, who was a, a Alamo nut from a little kid. Apparently, they watched the Disney show over in London, too. And he would play Alamo with, like, uh, you know, with his little toy soldiers in his backyard and his grandmother cut him a, a coonskin cap, but out of her, her rabbit fur coat. And he's just a big nut and he always loved it. And one time on tour, he, uh, one of his wives gave him an authenticated document from Sam Houston. And he realized with all the money he had, he could collect things. Well, after his music career was mostly done, he's back at it again. But after the, you know, the, the nineties, he became a very serious collector. And by serious, I mean voluminous. He would buy anything that people bought. He even bought a building one time next door to the Alamo to excavate the basement. And he found all these horseshoes, which he said were from the Alamo. Um, he's a romantic. He very clearly uh, loves to believe the myth and isn't quite a stickler for authenticity. And he had some people I think took advantage of him. And uh, so he, at one time he amassed what uh, was widely reputed to be the world's largest collection of Am Alamo memorabilia, and he needed to get it out of his basement. So the state of Texas took it on the condition that they build a museum within seven years, and that brings it to this year, 2021. Um, there's a problem. We looked into it. There are serious questions about the most uh, prominent items in the, the collection. Uh, the, the Jim Bowie knife, probably not a Jim Bowie knife. Davy Crockett's messenger bag with little tortilla chips in it. Probably not Davy Crockett's messenger bag with little tortilla chips in it. Uh, you know, it's so uh, we are now going to be on the hook for a few hundred million dollars to build a museum right outside the Alamo with a bunch of fake stuff in it or allegedly fake. There are questions. I can't say conclusively that it's fake, just yeah. that other people might think it's fake. Well, as long as we're in music mold, I'd like to quote the great philosopher, musician Tom Petty. Yes. Who, who said, you believe what you want to believe. And, and he does. And that's, yeah. and that's what made your book um, uh, uh, 
a, a right book for the time. You know, people need to know about this. We need to think about a lot of stuff that's happened in the past with this kind of a lens, you know, what really happened? Who, how did it get that way? Who were the, the characters involved? Not just the main characters, but the, those on the periphery. Who can help us understand this better? I just loved how you approach the book. I, I hope you sell a trillion copies, man. Well, thanks. It's selling well, but there's still some more if anyone wants to buy them. And uh, but you could print more if you need to. We could, we could. It's in its third printing, and we could always print more. I think it's. I want to leave on on one note that if people think that we're tearing down the myth, for others, we're we're taking down something that has been used as a cudgel uh, for Hispanic Texans for more than a hundred years. This has been a story that made them the bad guys in their own state's history. Um, I've got a friend, he grew up in San Antonio and they played Alamo in the street. He told me this maddeningly after we wrote the book. Uh, every day after school, they'd play Alamo. It was the white kids versus the brown kids, mm -hmm. except when they played it, the white kids always won. Um, most Hispanics in Texas do not want, know who won the Battle of the Alamo because it is always taught as a heroic Anglo myth. And if we can start teaching history that includes everyone, then maybe Hispanics won't feel like second-class citizens in what used to be their own country. Well, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. I'm a uh, pleasure to call your friend now, Jason Stanford, everybody, co-author of Forget the Alamo with Brian Burrow and Chris Tomlinson. It's an excellent read. You'll really enjoy it. There's so much more to it than just the battle. Thanks for being with me today. Thank you, Michael. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, sir.